How are you students? Uh, my name is Dr. Faris Tanjero. Uh, today I want to welcome you to my class. I'll be taking you through Introduction to Microeconomics, BED 1101. I hope you're staying safe and uh, I'll be glad that you are, you'll be listening to me. So we go on to our lesson. I want to carry you through today three lessons which have been categorized to lesson one, lesson two, and lesson three. Now in these three lessons, I'll take you through the basic concepts of economics, demand and supply, and elasticity. So there we go. I want us to first of all understand what is economics. I'm sure all of you, at some point, you have heard that word because it's a layman's language. But today we want to specifically understand what is economics. It is a field of study that focuses on how to efficiently allocate resources. And the reason being, all the resources that we have, whether it is time, whether it is material, be, uh, material things, Whatever resources that you may think about, all of them are scarce. And because they are scarce, we need to understand in this field of economics, how do we utilize them to satisfy our unlimited needs and we allocate them efficiently so that we are still able to satisfy all, all the needs that we have. Economics, basically, it is based on the concept of scarcity of resources. Againists unlimited needs. If you think of the human needs, they are very unlimited. We have so many needs that we can never satisfy all of them. And because we cannot be able to satisfy all of them, we need to know which one do we need to satisfy now, which one can we postpone to satisfy another day. So that is basically what economics is all about. Now, we know that we need to understand a few terms that are used in economics. The first one that I've explained is about the human wants, which sometimes we call them human desire, which we call also the human needs. Now, these are desires or needs that we always wish that I wish I would have this, I want to have the other item. Uh, today, I have bought this item. That doesn't satisfy my need. I still want another one. And basically, as a human person, we do not have a way where we can satisfy all our needs. And that is why we need to really understand uh, which needs must we satisfy now. So the human wants refers, as I've already said, refers to the people's desires or needs that must, uh, must be satisfied through the production of goods and services. Now, and basically, we all want to satisfy our needs so that we feel okay, we feel, we, we fulfill our well-being. Now, the items that we use to satisfy those needs, we call them economic resources. What, what are economic resources? These are all ingredients that are available, and they are supposed to provide goods and services in order to satisfy human needs. Note. Economic resources may also refer to the factors of production. Basically, the factors of production that, as we know, there are four. We talk about land, we talk about uh, entrepreneurship, we talk about capital, we talk about labor. And all these are meant to create goods and services to satisfy human needs. Now, we normally say that economics is a life subject because we live it every day. From the time we woke up in the morning, we needed, uh, before we woke up, we needed a bed. When we wake up, we need breakfast, we need lunch, we need clothing, we need... Basically, all those are things that a human being requires. And for him to satisfy all those requirements, we need to produce goods and services. And we produce goods and services from what we are calling economic resources, which basically are categorized into four, as I've already stated. What about the natural resources? The natural resources are said to be the gifts of nature. 
they are there. Man did not do anything to bring them into existence. However, if we are to benefit from the natural resources, we must be able to know, have the competency and the knowledge to exploit those resources. We talk about the mountains, we talk about the sea, we talk about the good climate, we talk about uh, soil, forest, all those are natural resources. They are God-given, we may say so. But for us to be able to benefit, we must know how to exploit those resources. And we keep asking ourselves, what creates even the differences, the economic differences between countries? Every country is endowed with specific economic or natural resources. And depending on how well they are able to exploit those resources and add value to them, that makes the difference in economic development between countries, even between individuals. If we are able to uh, utilize those resources that are naturally there, when you see a forest, for example, some of us will just see a forest and a nuisance. Somebody else will see as a natural resource that can be exploited and to add value into the human requirements. And basically that's what makes the difference even between countries. Then what about the man-made resources? Remember, I want to keep reminding you that we want to understand those basic uh, basic terms that are used in economics so that as we progress you'll be able to understand. So what about the man-made resources? These are equipments, they are anything that is created by man to create more efficiency as they produce goods and services. And we talk about tools, equipments, roads, buildings, etc. All those are man-made resources and they improve on the uh, production process. Now we continue to understand. I said earlier that um, economics is basically focused on efficient use of economic resources. And the reason why we need to utilize those resources efficiently is because of the what we call scarcity of those resources. So there is what we call scarce and choice. Because the resources are scarce, we always have to make a choice. We must know what is the need that we must satisfy now and what can we forego or what we can postpone to satisfy another day. So scarcity and choice, if the resources available are not enough, then the human or the consumer must make a choice. Now, the other thing that we need to understand that in making that choice, there is what a term that we refer to or we keep talking about in economics refer to as the opportunity cost. What is the opportunity cost? This is referred to as the best, the value of the best expected from the second best alternative. The choice to satisfy one alternative means that another one must be forgone. The value of the second best for gold alternative is what we call the opportunity cost. Basically, we say that opportunity cost is that which is uh, for gold being the actual cost of what is uh, chosen. Let me explain that. Maybe a student has got 100 shillings and he has a choice either to buy a plate of food or to buy a book. If he chooses to buy the plate of food, he must forgo the book. So the actual cost of that plate of food is not the 100 shillings, it is the book. Meaning that which is forgone being the actual cost of what is uh, chosen. Now let's look, go on in this line of thought. We are still trying to understand a few concepts that are used in, in economics. I'm still uh, basing or focusing on the issue of scarcity. There is what we call the production possibility frontier. I talked earlier about somebody having to choose between a plate of food or a book and he chooses maybe the plate of food and forgoes the book. Now, if we bring that concept into maybe a country concept, because of the scarcity of resources, a country must always choose 
where do I put more of my resources to achieve a certain level of output? Now, I want us to look at this. The PPF, which we call Production Possibility Frontier or Capacity of a Country, a country may decide, do I concentrate more in the production of manufactured goods or agricultural goods? This is just an example. If, for example, they, they increase the production of agricultural goods, it means that the, the country is putting more of its resources to the production of the agricultural goods. Similarly, if they chose to do the manufactured goods. So the PPF is a locus of all combination of points which represents goods and services that can be produced given all the resources or at full utilization of resources. Let's look at this curve here, which we are saying is a locus of point. We are saying when a country combines its resources to produce agricultural goods and manufactured goods, they, they, at full utilization, they will, they will move along this curve. Below this curve, the resources are underutilized. Above this curve, the resources are overutilized, which we say it is not, this is a situation that is not attainable, that is above the curve, unless there is increased or increase in technological uh, services. If we are able to increase or to advance our technology, it is possible that at full utilization, we are likely to achieve more. But in normal circumstances, we only move along this curve, which we are going, we are calling the production possibility frontier. That is for our country. And this is important as we emphasize on the fact that resources uh, are scarce, and therefore there is always a choice that a country must uh, be able to, to, to check. Now, I want us to ex explain that uh, points on the curve such as A and B, I go back to that curve. A and B, which are supposed to uh, actually, they have moved a bit, but they are on this line here, they are all possible. They are all possible, sorry, let me go there. P possible combined, uh, combined outputs of two commodities. That is the agricultural products and manufactured products. And every country must always weigh, where do we put our resources more? What will guide them in knowing that? What guides them is, number one, maybe the demand of its people. Or, alternatively, the level of development. Or alternatively, maybe the policy that the, the, that country has, they always must make a decision. Now, the country must make a decision on two extremes. If, for example, they chose to, pro, to put all its resources on agriculture, they must forego the manufactured goods and vice versa. Still, we go on. Uh, economics, as I said, it is a, a field of study, and it teaches us how to efficiently allocate resources. It is categorized into two branches, or into two areas, broad areas. And the first one, or we call it microeconomics. I want us to understand between the two branches. One is microeconomics, the other one is macroeconomics. The microeconomics is that branch of study that studies the behavior of the smallest decision-making unit in an economy. What why am I calling that, uh, that unit the smallest decision unit, which is the individual supplier, the individual consumer, the individual producer? It is small because when it makes the decision, it makes for its own behalf. When a consumer decides to buy a product X, for example, that consumer is making that decision depending on his own considerations. They are not doing it on behalf of another person. So that, that consumer, that producer, or that supplier is making the decision for himself and on his own behalf. So there are those factors that will influence 
his own personal decisions. For example, the price of the product, as we are going to look at later. So that is microeconomics. We study the behavior of that small unit, the consumer, the supplier, or the farm. Meanwhile, there is macroeconomics. Macroeconomics studies the behavior of the entire economy. And we call it, the, we, we look at the behavior of the largest decision-making unit, which is the country or the economy. And the decisions are made through the government policies or government agencies. Now, they make those decisions not for themselves, but on behalf of the entire economy. And because of that, the economy is disaggregated into broadly homogeneous categories that, and we determine what are these categories. For example, what is the issues of unemployment? What is the issue of the, the national income? So all those areas are aggregated together and the decisions are made for all those areas, the entire economy. So in macroeconomics, we look at uh, although in another unit, the national income, the economic growth and development, money and banking, public finance, unemployment, uh, population, inflation, and international trade. Unlike when we are talking of microeconomics, where we look at what is the demand by this consumer, what is the supply, uh, what is the supply of this consumer, we look at the consumer theory. We look at the production. We look at maybe the market structure. All those relate to an individual consumer and individual supplier. We ask ourselves, why is studying economics so important? Number one, economics creates some knowledge or understanding of the underlying principles on how to optimally utilize resources. It is very important that all of us, even, even as a society, as an individual, we need to know how do we efficiently allocate the resources. When we learn economics, we get to understand of the issues of scarcity and choice, the scarcity of resources. So we make prudent decisions. So studying economics will help us uh, make prudent decisions, even for our own lives. Now, when we study economics, we are able to appreciate the constraints, the constraints imposed by economic environment in which we live in. Now, economics is an analytical subject. Well, we are able to analyze situations. We are able to know, for example, there are times that um, in our normal lives, we may criticize a certain policy by the government. If I may give a, an example that we have had in Kenya, there are times that maybe sometimes the doctors will say, we are going on strike unless the government uh, adds us like 300% of our salary. And we ask ourselves, why is the government allowing the doctors to go on strike? People are dying for so, such a long time. But when we learn economics, we will be able to understand that the, there are things that the government must have to make a decision on. For example, when they add them 300 uh, percent of their salary, what is the implication on what is the implication on the national income? What is the implication to the other people? How much tax must we be added so that we can they can be given the 300? What about the issues of inflation? So when we learn economics, we are able to understand these things and we are able to uh, appreciate all those. Uh, being able to analyze uh, this. Now, knowing the importance of economics, we want to understand how do systems, economic systems work. I'll keep reminding you that we are trying and bringing in the basic issues that are there in economics so that we are able to understand what really happens uh, around us. We are talking about the decisions that are made by the entire economy. Now, when the economy is making a decision, it will depend on what kind of a system they have adopted. I want us to go to the next thing, which I'm calling economic systems. We need to understand this so that we know what guides this economy to make these decisions. 
basically the economic systems are or they refer to, way, to the way in which uh, three basic decisions are made for example which are the goods to be produced how will they be produced how will they be distributed incidentally the economic systems that we observe in the world are determined sometimes by the colonial masters for example if you observe kenya we borrowed so much from our colonial master you go to another country like tanzania the decisions that guide them are basically influenced in a large extent by who colonized them in tanzania for example they were colonized by people who believed in, uh, I think they call it Ujama or Udugu, I don't know. But they, they, they have adopted that system such that whatever is produced is meant for all of them. Unlike in Kenya, where we believe in capitalists, capitalism, in Tanzania, they believe in socialism. And that is really what influences the decisions that are made and creates a specific economic system so let's look at a number of these systems we are going to talk about the first uh, system that we call a free market economy also called a capitalist economy or razor sphere it is where in this system decisions are made by individuals depending on the price mechanism depending on the market the individuals in this economy are allowed to allocate their to make decisions on where to allocate their resources what to produce how to distribute the what they produce at what price basically it is free for all the government does not have major controls or major uh, rules or regulations that govern this uh, production the allocation of resources so a free market has the following features for example the individuals in that market or in that economy they are free to own properties they are able to own their private properties they have a right to dispose the properties as they wish they have a right to allocate to pro to allocate resources to whichever area i may choose to do buildings somebody else will choose to produce maize, another person will choose to do whatever. We are free to do that as long as we are living in a free market economy. Now, in this market economy, there is free choice of enterprise. Every individual has a right to, to buy, to hire, to produce whatever uh, they want, to organize their resources in whichever they want. They want. There is free pursuit of personal goals and personal interests. In this kind of an economy, there is major competition in production and distribution of whatever uh, goods and services that one may decide to, to, to do. There is reliance on what we call the price mechanism. In a price mechanism, it is where the forces of demand and supply dictates the, the market prices. Now, that means that the suppliers will be motivated to produce that output or that product and bring to the market as long as it's going to fetch to the, uh, for them the maximum profit that they can get. Meanwhile, the consumer in this same market has a right to choose to buy whatever they wish. So basically, it is the issue of the demand and supply. In this kind of free market economy, there is no government intervention. The government has not put on rules and regulations on what to produce, where to distribute, and what, uh, how to distribute it. The government does not really interfere in this market. There are property rights. People can own properties. They can uh, have even copyrights, patents, on what they have produced on their own innovations. Basically, that, those are the features for the free market economy. I want us to compare that market economy with the second uh, economy, which we call a planned economy. In a planned economy, which we also call command economy or government-controlled economy, we sometimes also call it a socialism or communism, 
the government decides on what to produce, how to distribute it, how to produce it. It sets the targets. It sets almost everything. The, gov the government is the decision maker in this market. And therefore, even the prices in this market are dictated by the price, by the government, sorry. They are dictated by the government. They are not left free for the forces of demand and supply to dictate and create the market price. It is the government that does that. Now, there is other features of this planned economy include, number one, that the leadership and the, and the leadership controls the economy. All important means of production, for example, the resources, are owned, are publicly owned. We hear of the public land. In an eco a planned economy, the entire land is owned by the, the, the government and the government distributes as it wishes depending on how it wants to, to create uh, maybe this, uh, production zones. So that is how the government controls. There is the issue of rationing of certain commodities, the way they will be supplied, the way they will be distributed. Now, the targets to be produced are dictated by the government. The prices, the wages are all determined by the government. There is occasional existence of restriction, restricted labor market in which workers can take up assigned jobs. The government decides what to produce and how to distribute. That is a planned economy. We have a third kind of economy, which we call a mixed economy. It brings in the features of a free market and a planned market. In this economy, almost uh, maybe let's talk about maybe 70 percent could be free but there's still an element where in some area or sectors we have the government control i want to give an example of kenya as a mixed economy why because in some areas we find the government dictating on what to produce and how to distribute including the prices through the price controls in the fuel industry for example we hear the government say that this liter of petrol will be sold at this much. That is an example of uh, where the government is coming in to control, uh, to put some controls in some areas. The government through different ways may motivate suppliers through taxation, through increased prices. They may motivate suppliers to produce a specific good. That is a way, one way of controlling the economy. So, and still... In, uh, in other areas, the government may just leave things free. For example, when you talk about the milk industry in Kenya, it's a free market. Anybody can get in, anybody can get out. Anybody can start selling milk today, anybody can stop selling milk today. You know, the foodstuffs that we have, again, that is a free. Everybody can be able to get into that market and uh, get out. So Kenya is a practical example of a mixed economy where the government controls some sectors and the government leaves free some other sectors. Now we want to ask ourselves uh, about how the government really puts some controls. The government has got two main tools in which it can kind of create some level of control even in a mixed economy. Through the, what we call the fiscal policy where the government uses taxes to stabilize the economy. In some areas where the government wants uh, maybe the suppliers to supply less of a product, they tax them more. They, in areas where they want them to be motivated to bring more into the market, they may subsidize those goods. So through the fiscal policy, the government, as a tool, the government can be able to regulate what is happening in, in the economy. Another way, another tool that the government uses, it is the, what we call the monetary policy. Through the central bank, the government can dictate the base rates or the, the operations of the commercial banks, whether to, to release more into to the market or to release less into the market. And when they use the interest rates, when they increase or decrease the interest rates by the commercial banks, through the central bank, then they are able to dictate how much money is circulating in the economy, how much investment is going to happen in the economy. And that way, the government is still able to utilize, uh, to regulate some areas 
and also to set free some other areas. Although we may not go into what are the benefits of each of these, I want you students, in your own time, you may look at what are the advantages and disadvantages of each. For example, when we talk about the free market economy, what are the advantages? One of the advantages that maybe I can say, although it is not in the slides, is the fact that people can own property. They are motivated to, to produce more because there is a chance that they are, they are set free to make more profits. And that way, there is advancement of innovations, there is creativity, and uh, kind of the economy is able to move faster. We talk about the disadvantages. Another disadvantage is that uh, one key disadvantage of a free market is the fact that there is that big gap between the rich and the poor. There is political instability in the economy because some, some members of the society may feel disadvantages, disadvantaged because, after all, there is those people who are able to really move fast and make more money from them, and they have been let free by the government. That could be. What about the plant economy? In a plant, one key advantage of the economy, of a plant economy, is the fact that there is, the government is able to plan and therefore reduce the gap between the rich and the poor, and it is able to ensure that every member of the society has got what they require. Because it's the government that dis decides on the distribution of those resources, and therefore it is able to create some kind of equality, which is good. But on the other hand, we can look at what is the disadvantages of a planned economy, for example, where people are not really let free to really innovate and be creative. Sometimes the economic development is slow. So, and that becomes an undoing where people are not motivated. After all, whatever they produce, it is shared amongst all of them. That is the character of communism, economy. So, people are not able to to really be encouraged to produce more. And as such, the, 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 the level or the, or the rate at which the economy grows is a bit slow. And we can cite a few examples, although I may not quote them here. Now, what about a mixed economy? In a mixed economy, again, it tries to bring in the features of the two, but still it has its own disadvantages. There is extreme, for example, there is extreme competition. There is overutilization of resources. And again, uh, sometimes even when the government dictates or regulates some areas, it may not have real full control, and that could be a disadvantage. Now, that marks the end of our first lesson. And I'm leaving you with a few questions here. I've asked you to briefly define the term economics, which we have already done it. And uh, what is the production possibility frontier? Distinguish between micro and macro economics. What is an economic system, which we have just uh, discussed right now? And we ask ourselves, why are we studying economics? Why, what is it that we really need to know? Why is it we normally say economics is a live subject, is a social science? And it teaches us on how to behave and to make prudent decisions. So we ask ourselves, why do we need to study? You can look at it later, and then you explain the advantages and disadvantages of the three economic systems. And uh, that marks the end of our first uh, lesson. Uh, thank you so much. Stay safe and continue to sanitize and to wear a mask. Thank you. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website.
Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.